Uh-oh. We found one of those in here. Um, there's only one thing that I'm missing right now. If I could just have two pieces of glasses. I was giving myself it, but then I was Thank you very much. Um, so, Sarah? Yes. Was it one of those rattlesnakes? I just want to give you. No, the milk thing. Yeah, that is. Shush, boys. I got the microphone covered. Um, I just want to chat for a minute because we haven't had the chance to catch up at all. Thank you for all the information. It was great hearing from both of you, um, just the details of the questions that I asked and then being able to talk to you too. Um, but I, uh, I'm excited that you're here. Thank you for coming. Sarah, I don't know I mean, how much time you've had or any opportunity to see what's going on in Pennsylvania, but Pennsylvania is pretty far behind. And Sarah and I talked about this in terms of like just like the cohesive wine industry, but Galen Glenn is leading the way. Like they are absolutely at the very front of quality. Excellent. Focus. It's very, very cool to see. And part of choosing Sarah to be a part of this and you and the guys that are here is just that pioneering spirit for what could be considered these wine making frontiers. And that's really why we selected it. Look, this makeup is very intentional. It wasn't just let's pick a random human. I mean, no. And I suppose we're going to, we're going to get into the climate and all that stuff that's going on in Pennsylvania. Yeah. Cause I have, of course really I'm going to have, I'll have as many questions as anybody else will. So you will. And that's the idea is that it's a conversation between us because I think that the conversation between us is going to be more interesting to everybody than just us like firing off these things. And that's how we try to establish this is that life is really a discussion. Um, I really do very little except kind of steer the this conversation. And if Sean gets too introspective, with too many music references or whatever happens or Sarah. <laughs> so we get it. So we just keep it like, we keep it together. But I'm into cartoons. Into cartoons. Okay, that's fine. So we'll just keep that in. But what is exciting is I, um, lost I saw lost both of yours and I've been reading all the information from both of you. Sarah, I will ask very specifically about some of the key words that you put in there. And one of the things that you said was that deep Pennsylvania. And the way you describe it. So just as you described it to me, it was great. Like I said, it's your show. You talk about it in whatever way you want. But I found that compelling because it's what makes each of these three regions that we're focusing on very, very different. And same thing, Maynard, with the um, you talk about growing Mediterranean grapes and all the things that went in. I, that's unique because you're unique in that you're growing Mediterranean grapes. But I have a little bit of a segue because Sean is too. But it's just for very different reasons that make it possible, as you saw when you were here last year. So it, yes. I'll try to keep those segues going, but I'm not going to manipulate it that much. I want it to be a conversation about, like, amongst all of us, and primarily you four from a viticultural and agricultural and winemaking perspective. Cool? Okay. That's it. Great. Wow, what do we do? We had a whole half hour, and we like 13 minutes. Well, some of the <laughs> other stuff that Amanda's been working on and Christy, Meredith, he, on our end, is to try to get the audience spread out with um, you know, areas through our, our distribution channels around the country, but also like with different sounds. We try to get it to be not a sales pitch as much as a wine conversation. And so hopefully we're starting to get the, the young buyer crowd in the restaurant and retail level interested in as well. Yeah. Um, so don't hesitate to get into tech stuff. What's uh, well, what wine are we starting with? Good question. Well, because we have so many wines, because there's four wineries represented, I was going at the initial, at the beginning, I just wanted to ask why you chose the wines that you did. And we'll talk about them briefly. Yes, it's about the wine, but I want it to be more about the region too. And as that wine might reflect what you're doing in the region. Like for you in particular, the Garnacha is to me, the coolest thing happening in Arizona right now, and like having that, had the opportunity to taste a lot, like you, there's even Paso, like Garnacha is not delightful in right. much of the new, I mean, I would say in the United States. You're nailing it. I don't know if you're picking early, what you're, but you know, whatever it is that you're doing is killing this. I'm not gonna tell you. <laughs> Take it in whatever way works for you, my friend. But I like to me, what, why is this wine a window into where you are? Right. Because it's about these regions. And, and I, this wine knocks my thoughts off. Okay? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, yeah, we can, we're going to go deep on that because it is, it is definitely the one I was resisting, uh, acknowledging, but I think it's because everybody in the state was kind of leaning toward Rhone's, but they're, it's not 
we're not Rhone. We're we're Spain. So it's like Monastrell and Garnacha, not not Morved and Syrah and Petit. This is one of my favorites. I've had several from you and from, but this is one of my favorites. I was really like, I love it. It's delicious. And I've been super into Ochocha Barrels lately. I think we must have talked about it. And then we could, I couldn't get it. It wasn't around. And then I reached out to the former, like the importer. He's like, well, I have one more container coming. I'm like, pack it full. <laughs> Take what I can. It was my COVID. I'm feeling sorry for myself. Impulse mind. And then Sarah, same thing for you because of the wines that you have. Like, why did you choose the Red German Bastards? And the name, by the way, is hilarious. Just to throw this out there between you and Sean and your naming is tongue in cheek and very funny. Maynard, you have very specific naming as well, but it's, it's a different, I don't, it's just a, that's also a fun conversation that can be had or not. If it comes up, I don't want to force anything. But again, it comes back to why is that a window into your region that people wouldn't otherwise know? Like why that great variety? Why that one? Okay. I want people to understand that one of the big points that I'm going to bring up, and I brought it up to both of you when we were talking before, is the different uh, consumer too, and how do we bridge that gap between the um, maybe inexperienced but open-minded and adventurous consumer, this young one that's willing to try anything? I'm gonna shoot where it's from. I don't care what great variety it is. I don't care how it's made. I'm into anything. I'll try anything. Well, they care how it's made, but you just make it up. But that's what I mean. They don't necessarily know what good wine is, right? Yeah. And then you have this. We'll call them vintage, not older consumer, but like a more vintage consumer who, if it yeah. isn't expensive, it isn't good, and if they don't know what it is, it isn't good. Right. So how do we kind of bridge that gap, especially for these in, for our emerging regions? I don't think we can be dependent on the emergent buyer or the emergent consumer, but it it comes down to like just consumer education and again bridging that gap. And so that those discussions that will happen organically is very much a conversation. It's not. Well, we, we we look at the labels and things. They if you look closely, they're all very unique to their region, but they don't shout like I don't put a big like Michigan map on front of the thing. I mean, people have to kind of. Oops, Jesus, that's a good start right there. Um, uh, yeah, anyways. Christy? Yes. Sean here. We have a spill. My Italian lessons aren't going well. The hand gestures are we all have haven't good. even We haven't even started, Sean. Very demonstrative. And maybe I have some stitches. I watched tennis last night, so I'm going back first. Well, he has one. Well, that's just what to do. Sean's spilling on the stitching as opposed to spitting into the stitching. I am. So we need yeah. to amend that. <laughs> Well, point being. I know, I'm fine. I'm fine. Get all the stuff. This is why you do this. We get it on. Sarah, do you have any thoughts or comments or questions before we get started? Not yet, but maybe I'm sure as we go along. I loved your deep Pennsylvania <laughs> discussion. That was very interesting to me. That's where we live. <laughs> but I was shocked. Like I, it, the rain and how it splits, it feels like the bays sometimes. Do, I mean, maybe you share it with these guys just for a second so they can kind of calibrate what I'm talking about. You mean the, the fact that we're in a rain shadow? Yeah, the way you were discussing how the rain comes through or? Yeah, so um, our property, the vineyard sits atop, um, we're at the end of the glaciers and we own a little glacially carved glen and we're on a ridge at about a thousand feet. So on either side of us, are larger valleys and very often in the summer you can watch the rain arrive from the west and split around us and travel down the valley. So it'll be raining north and south of us but not on our property. Um, you can see the lightning, it's actually quite beautiful. It happens frequently. Okay. So, so just a natural part of the geography of our, our location. How's your battle going with the 2,4-D sprayers? better. <laughs> um, so we have connected with um, an Israeli firm, which is the international expert in detecting drift. Um, so they've taken us on pro bono and are really able to pinpoint where a drift incident would come from. And this is the herbicide drift you were talking about. Your yes, herbicide drift. We have had several years of really challenging herbicide drift because we're up so high in our location 
Um, and it's so windy here, it's windy here every day. Um, if someone sprays herbicide up to two miles away, it can travel onto our property. Like golf courses or? No, this is farm applications. Farm? Yeah. yeah, yep. So yeah, we're having we're having a similar issue down in uh, in Wilcox. We have an eighty acre site uh, in southern Arizona, and we've gone completely off of herbicides on that site. We're using a lot of ground cover now, but we're surrounded by other vineyards who don't give a shit about that. So yeah, and it's windy. And it's windy. It's windy down there. So you know the the vineyard to the right, to the vineyard to the left. If they're doing any of that, we're getting it. Yeah, we at least at least we're not doing it so yeah it's hard and for us it was destroying our crop i have a vineyard that's in a little mcmansion complex and uh, we're seeing it and we actually battled successfully <clears throat> to get that area to stop using it by working with their company and uh, but these people really prize their lush green lawns and they hate damn on it was uh, it's worked so far, but we've got uh, another site. I have a guy who grows Pinot Gris for us that we are having obvious 2,4-D damage, and I, and I said you got to stop spraying this. We looked at the neighbor, neighbors like I'm not doing it. Um, is it we talked around. Well, yeah, I go in his garage, and he's like, "Here's what I'm spraying," and, and it was uh, I, I, like we looked at the active ingredients, and that big word that's 2,4-D. That's what I'm talking about. You can't. You, well, it's called weed and feed or something. Nice <laughs> to be up to the text. Yeah. Um, it's second. a fun battle. Yeah, it's it's very difficult. This will be exciting. We'll be right back. Oh, I have to. We're gonna take a commercial break. We'll be right back. Hope you all join Wait, us on the other side. Wait, not yet. We're doing another computer. Should I just continue drinking this Gruner? Yes, you should. This is why we started. Okay. <laughs> my favorite, one of my favorite Gruners is, uh, I don't know how to pronounce it, Nigel? Nigel. Nigel. Uh, the, the sparkling uh, Shard uh, Gruner blend. That, that's what we drank for our um, engagement in oh. New York City. Yeah. We ventured into um, New York a couple weeks ago when it was still a ghost town, and the winning open was Valva. And I made a dumb gesture to pay for everything. And we just, a couple of us had like a $650 bar tab on Austrian sparkling. That, that, that was good. <laughs> but memorable. Yeah, memorable. Yeah, yeah. You're going to be selling some stamps to cover that. Yeah. yeah, I wasn't there, so we might have to do it again. I mean, it's, it's in Tribeca, I think it says that. Right. In the hinterlands, I forgot how expensive that city can be. Yeah, we went. Uh, I was going to try to propose to her out at the Statue of Liberty, but we couldn't. We couldn't get out there, and um, it was just it was a mess. So we ended up going to uh, Rikers Island mm -hmm. instead. With the Rikers and to propose? Where whatever the the where the where. <laughs> we went to prison. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, uh, we went to where the immigration came in in 1900. Uh, what's that? Uh, oh. Ellis Island. Okay. Ellis, like not prison. No. <laughs> um, uh, out there, but I had the I had the ring and I'm I and I realized they were checking for metal and I didn't want to present it out at, at Ellis. So we waited, but eventually we got back to the Empire State Building. We went to the top and I gave it to her up there. But like going through security, I forgot of all the security stuff. Like I'm having to like hide it in a bin at an angle where she can't see the bin <laughs> to put it through <laughs> security. And then get it back, and then we went and saw Ahmed Jamal at the uh, at the Vuno. So you pulled it off, right? Yeah, pulled it off. All right, good job. <laughs> it's gotta be nerve wracking too when it's out of your possession. What's that? Oh, uh, someone had a printer. First one. I'm going by bottle shape. Um. So we're up for the text chat. So I'll get all the questions that come in from other people, other triage. So if there's anything random that doesn't make sense to ask, it just doesn't get through. We have changing in a second. Okay, changing. I'm changing. Mm -hmm. Ooh, I like that. She'll be right back. I like that angle of me. Every time I see myself on the screen, I'm like, oh, the <laughs> shift. Uh oh. 
You're stuck with me now. Sorry. Hmm. What's uh, what's in the red? In the red, um, Cabernet Dorsa and Zweigelt. Ah, Zweigelt, nice. What is your white? It's um, obviously a Bianca oh. and does uh, and Chardonnay, 50-50. Uh, in many years, it's co-fermented, but sometimes not. Uh, but Malvisia here is it's one of those grapes that California kind of poo poos on because they just think it's because they grow it and it gets all jammy and gross and thick and syrupy. And but out here it's so versatile. I can pick it super early and it's crisp and and bright, or I can pick it a little later and leave it on skins and do a badass orange wine with it too. So it's very it's very versatile. It's really gorgeous. It sings in the glass, really, really beautiful. Oh, thank you. Really a uh, touch of oak. Uh, usually mostly stainless steel, but about, you know, a couple barrels. It'll have like a 350 gallon tank or 400 gallon tank with the, with the white blend. And then maybe two barrels, uh, neutral, neutral barrels, uh, with the rest of it that we blend back in. Cause we just want to kiss. We don't want, we don't want a lot of oak on it. Yeah. It's really beautiful. And the red is equally dynamic and gorgeous as well. Yeah, it's, I think once we get a, once this all wraps up, we'll have to get each other's addresses and we'll send you, we're doing, you know, like, uh, like um, uh, Amanda said, we're doing, uh, I'm doing Nebbiolos, I'm doing Barbera, Sangiovese, um, Tempranillo, Monastrel, Graciano, Cezao, Sagrantino, just crazy amounts of stuff because we just don't know yet what's singing and so far. Oh, we just want to, uh, we want to, judges or whatever the gold medal in the Texom with the with the Sagrantino. Oh wow. Oh, cool. Congratulations. For, the, for, the, for yeah. the sensei. Yeah. That's one of those ones you find that we you know, weren't sure and you get it growing and you're like, is it going to be all jammy like Palo Bea? It wasn't. It's got structure and it's you know it's got elegance. It's got you know balls. Palo Bea is awesome in many years though. So. It is. It, in, 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 the, in the better years it's amazing, but it can get VA it tends it's a higher Almost alcohol. VA. Yeah. So yeah, we made well we we want to we want a medal from a bunch of dudes I've never met. Nicely done. But hey, you know, they're a neighbor, Texas, yeah. Yeah. Well good market. Well let's do one of the medals then. I'm just waiting for someone to come in. I we've been so ready. So ready. Remarkably ready. I'm gonna shuffle papers. I've already spilled my glass of wine, so I got that out of the way. But then you can't see the Right up there. There's an old my incubator turning the button quail eggs. That's exciting. We have friends incubating eggs right now for chick, like chicken chicken. Yeah. We live? Yeah. Hi. Welcome, Welcome to the barrel room. Welcome to Brian's barrel room. Um, I'm Amanda, your moderator. We're excited. This is our, I think, fourth installment of Live at the Barrel Room. Left yes. with Charlie and Travis City, and we've been making a concerted effort to have people join our conversation about wine region, uh, wine making technique, wine making vessels, all the topics that will help broaden the conversation, especially as they relate to uh, wine regions at the edge. Which I feel like we're sitting on the edge. Not with one leg off, but like it's right at the edge. Like if you really backed off a little too far, then the chair would slip. So I think from Northern Michigan, we can, we can speak to edges really well. I would argue that our wonderful guests today can also do so. And it's very exciting and a privilege to welcome two friends and uh, people who have visited our wine region. And I haven't had the privilege of visiting uh, Pennsylvania yet, but I look forward to in the future um, and have been to Arizona. But we have Sarah Troxel. Uh, from Galen Glen Winery in deepest Pennsylvania, which she will share with us shortly, and Mayor James Keenan from Caduceus Cellars in Merkin Vineyard in Arizona. And we are discussing today making game-changing wines at the edge of viticultural viability. Now, while viticultural viability, I think, is broader than we give it credit for, what we're doing is really exploring uh, what I would argue are world-class and extraordinary wines made in places that the general consumer is not aware of necessarily makes not just wine, but truly great wine. And so it's a privilege to have you both on. Thank you so much for coming. Um, Sarah, if we could start with you, I'd love, oh, I guess I should introduce Sean. 
Oh yeah, I, him. <laughs> I feel like he's always That's here. Funny, guys. <laughs> so here from Michigan, I'm lucky. I'd like flanked by Brian Over because you know who's our hosting winemaker and also a guest with his wine team featured today. Uh, from Bluff with Charlie in Traverse City, and also from Traverse City uh, on Old Mission Peninsula from Mari Vineyards, a Shaughnessy, who's the wine maker there. So it's a pleasure to have you both as well. Yeah, thanks all for joining us. I yeah. think what's been fun about this is having this ability to get together, and obviously uh, they're not so weird anymore, but it used to feel weird doing this whole computer talking and being gentle. But, um, it's fun to, to get together and have a chance to taste these. Um, a lot of effort was put together by um, by Mater and Sarah and Sean and Christy, not me, um, to get the wine shipped. So we're actually tasting each other's wines while we're um, separated by thousands of miles of interstate and mountains and uh, other cool geological features like Great Lakes. Um, thank you all for, for being here, and let's, let's dig in. What are we tasting first? Well, I'd like each, uh, I'd like Sarah to start and Tell us not only where you are, I would like to hear specifically about deepest Pennsylvania, but I would like you to also introduce each of the wines that you've selected and explain why those are a window into your unique wine region. Thank you. Um, so our winery is located in what we refer to as deep Pennsylvania. It's very rural, it's very untamed. Um, the smallest village near us is only about a thousand people. Um, the vineyard sets on a ridge at about a thousand feet, just north of the Blue Mountains, and the Blue Mountains are the edge of the glaciers. So our name Galen refers to my husband, and then Glen is the shape of our property. When the glaciers came down 10,000 years ago, they carved a glen. Um, so our wine cellar rests in the glen, and then up on the two highest points are the vineyards. Um, and then around us, are some valleys. So in the summer, it's typical for the rain to kind of circle either north or south and, and miss our property. So we're, what is in, we're in what's referred to as a rain shadow. Um, I chose Gruner Vetliner because back in 2000, I was inspired after reading about it in Food and Wine. And by 2003, we were able to plant some vines making our plantings the second oldest in the US. Um, so Gruner is something that we're very passionate about. We now have two other clones in addition to the original suitcase clone that we planted in 2003. Um, and then the other one is our Red German Bastards, named because we grow two varieties that only the Germans would love, Cabernet Dorsa and Zweigelt. And the name came from when our daughter returned to become our wine grower. She had been traveling the world, um, has her undergraduate degrees from Cornell and then her master's from France and Germany. Um, so when she came back, I'd ask her, hey, where are you going? What are you doing today? I'm going to work in those red German bastards you and dad planted while I was away. And so she would say this, she said it for the first year she was back, I hate these red German bastards, why did you plant them? They're very difficult um, to grow, they're very tangly, the leaves are extra large, so they require a lot of additional handwork to maintain them and keep the canopies open. So when it came time to name the blend, I said, I'm going to name it that, and she said, you'll never get that approved. Well, <laughs> I got the stamp from the TTV and um, it's been uh, wildly popular ever since. So thank you for having us and thank you for showcasing Deep Pennsylvania. I'd also like to say it's very cool that your daughter is the official seventh generation farming your husband. Yeah, family. we're very excited. She is the seventh generation on our farm. So my husband is sixth. So our property's been in our family. Yeah. Great. Maynard, kind of the same question. I mean, you're in a unique area. Um, we'll get into some parallels with other world wine regions, but why these two wines? Uh, well, I think um, Mavisia Bianca is a is a grape that um, and grown anywhere else in the U.S. Um, doesn't express like it does in in Arizona. Uh, California ends up being kind of jammy and syrupy and and uh, gooey. Uh, out in, in Arizona, it's a very versatile grape. We can pick it early. It's bright and crisp and focused. Uh, we can pick it late and do like an orange wine out of it, um, but it doesn't ever get 
it doesn't ever get syrupy or sappy. Uh, so it's a nice, it's a nice secret weapon aromatically. Um, and it's a, it's great on its own or it's great in a blend. Uh, so in with that is 50% Chardonnay. So, um, that was just a nice balancing act between those two. And it initially just started as an accident. That's all I had. Um, it's a logistical decision I made uh, between the two. And we liked the results so much, I just continued it. And for the other wine, the red, it's a Garnacha, our area. Uh, the, the entire state of Arizona is very much a, an expression of Mediterranean grapes, um, you know, part two, right? So we're growing everything uh, here. But I think just for... Um, I think when you're getting geeky about wine, I think we forget about um, keeping it delicious. And I think out of Arizona, delicious is garnacha. Will you describe just a little bit about what Arizona, I know you have two distinct areas, your northern area and your southern area, but can you describe just maybe in general what Arizona is about, if you could and encapsulate it for people? Yeah, so when you're looking at places like the, like the Mediterranean growing area, you're, you're thinking of, uh, of, of latitude. And I think the closer you get to the equator, they just assume it's not going to work. Uh, but what we have here is altitude. So we're growing between 3,300 feet and 5,000 feet all over the state. So we have extreme diurnal swings, but we have a fairly moderate winter. We'll have snow in the winter. Um, then we'll have monsoons in the summer. So we do get a little precipitation, uh, but it's the elevation that ends up kind of being the game changer for us. Kind of like, it's like, it's like Mendoza, but uh, without the Malbec. <laughs> well, and I noticed you have just slightly more, and actually I want to talk about that a little later. You have slightly more rainfall than Mendoza, but only like by three inches, I think, when you get yeah. just the Cornville area of vineyards in particular. Yep. Um, really interesting. And then Michigan, when we talk, so obviously we have this deep Pennsylvania and then this sort of, I don't know if you call it a high mesa, but this like higher elevation, but closer to the equator. And here in Michigan, if you could start maybe, Sean, and just talk about maybe Old Michigan Peninsula in particular and our proximity, the water influence and the proximity to the equator. Well, I want that in, one thing that's kind of captured my fancy uh, over the last uh, 15 years or so is that we're actually part of a greater Great Lakes region. Because I've been at many conferences where there's somebody from Ontario and somebody from the Finger Lakes, and whoever stalks first, we just kind of say, well, kind of like that, but just a little bit more cold or a little bit more warm. Um, we're on the northwest corner of the Great Lakes. Um, when you cross Lake Michigan, you won't see any of the Nipra, European grape varieties being grown. Um, I mean, we look at wintertime, Duluth goes down regularly down to 20, 30 below zero. But luckily, the winds come across Lake Superior, Lake Michigan, and by the time they get to us, it's, it's just a uh, balmy 10 degrees Fahrenheit. And that gives us a window to grow the grapes we do. It's always, I mean, the history doesn't go back that long, but uh, when the first settlers, uh, white settlers came here, they planted a lot of fruit trees and there's a lot of cherries and there used to be a lot of peaches and things. Now it's mostly apples and cherries and uh, wine grapes. And it's a nice little window to grow things right in the edge. Our winters are a limiting factor. But when I look at the whole West Coast on fire or I look at hail and burgundy, I mean, disasters are part of what our terroir, and that's our limiting factor, but those days protect us. Usually, most years, nine out of ten, we're okay. It's that tenth year that we have to get creative. Um, I just wanted, while well, we're talking about this, and maybe Brian to address water. You know, Mater mentioned monsoons. Sarah mentioned this parting of the rains. We obviously are in this Great Lakes Basin, and water is obviously essential to any kind of agriculture, viticulture, too. Um, and I'm just curious of influences and what you see the biggest difference between these regions. Well, yeah, I was briefly in Arizona. I was I worked at uh, R.W. Webb down in Vail, south of Tucson. There's not a lot of water down there, but they didn't grow the grapes there. But um, coming here, seeking out fruit in uh, a wine region, you know, what we have is the, the depth of the Great Lakes, Lakes I think, is sometimes um, misunderstood. And it's a big body of water that is, even has subtle tides. There is um, an undercurrent. There's actually, Lake Michigan is really split into two zones where you have different currents happening. And that power of that water is really influencing. Like Sean said, we're on the leading edge of all the, the cold weather coming from Canada, from the West, that may be sweeping in at the times of year, like ripening, um, flood break, all that kind of stuff, where we can have influences from that water temperature alone. In the, in the spring, it being cool, 
Um, when we get warming influences coming, we, we're still kind of kept at bay uh, early, and uh, the buds <laughs> kind of hold back and don't, don't open up, so we don't get exposed to some of the early frost damages multiple times. And then during the course of the summer, heats up, and we have um, the warming impact when the Canadian influence starts to come back in in October, and we're looking at cold, cold systems coming through that potentially could wreck us. I live off of the Appalachian, and at my house, it can be, you know, 28 degrees, but out in our vineyards, it can be 42 degrees, and um, that's because of that water influence. That, you know, that little dome um, keeps us just a little bit warmer, a little bit longer, and extends our season abnormally long. Um, so we start late, and we finish late, and um, that gives us just enough window to do a certain amount of things in our vineyards, which kind of explains why we grow and do what we do here. So why Blau Frankish is kind of a window into the region as far as you're concerned? Yeah, so we were looking at for a red grape um, that would like to be here, um, that would participate in this little terroir experiment, if you will. And Blau Frankish has this um, propensity to want to ripen fairly quickly, yet it, in our area it will hold. It doesn't really fully mature until the very end of the season. Um, so we can start to see a rapid sugar rise um, in maybe the early part or early, let's say early October, um, and then it'll kind of plateau and hang on. And in that time, it's really working on its acidity and tannin development where um, if that starts to peter down and, the, and the, the grapes or the sugars rise slightly and we get up into a, kind of a full complement of acid, tannin, sugar balance. And um, it's winter hardy to what we have to see for winters. Um, it likes to produce when it's a, a lean year here. Uh, we don't get a lot of the green flavors. Um, we can still make really interesting wine on it. So it's got versatility. And the thing I love to tout is that it's great for the farm. Um, I don't have to go to farmers and say, hey, plant this cool red variety. We're going to try to ripen this. And then, uh, yeah, cut it down a ton per acre because we can't really ripen it. Um, this one needs a crop. It's, uh, like Sarah was talking about big leaves, uh, like Spigel to uh, Blanc Frankish is a parent, I believe, right? Mm -hmm. um, has those big leaves and that kind of attitude that it, it wants to be there, but we have to open it up to the sunshine. Um, so I chose Blau Frankish because I do believe it has a, a very important future in Michigan um, through everything we've seen. We started in 2001 with it, and we're seeing nothing but consistency and positive kind of reinforcement from our minds. And then, Sean, you actually chose a couple, two white blends, but I want to, I want you to talk about the wines you chose to showcase kind of the window of this mm -hmm. region, but also the Malvasia Bianca. I find that to be an extremely unique connection between you and Maynard and what's happening there, and I'd love for you guys to talk and about And Sarah, that. and I got the Gruner connection, too, so that's why I kind of picked those. Um, Malvasia, uh, like Maynard mentioned, um, Malvasia is, uh, there's many, many, many varieties in Italy called Malvasia. And the Italians, when they like something, um, they name everything it, and... Um, this one, from what I can tell from the literature, is Malvasia Moscato that originally came from Piemonte. Um, you know, the settlers, the people, the immigrants that came over to uh, the United States brought it with them. And from what I can understand from the Italian sources, it no longer is grown in Piemonte in any kind of quantity. So we actually have a really nice um, uh, subtype of uh, Malvasia that nowhere else has. Um, but it grows, I picked it for uh, Michigan because I made a kind of a um, wild guess that we can handle grapes that grow in subalpine or alpine areas of Italy. And Malvasia does up in Istria, although it is probably another subtype, uh, grow well. And uh, although Italy is much more warmer these days, it hasn't always been. And some of these varieties have been grown for over, you know, uh, hundreds and hundreds, if not longer years. There's a good chance that the farmers want to replant these things if they can handle a cold winter or two. And we immediately tested it the first year we planted it when we had 20 below zero for two years in a row uh, for multiple times of the Arctic um, uh, vortex, vortices that came down. Um, I like it like Maynard said, it has a different, um, it has these beautiful aromatics and I like it when it ripens on the, not the oily lush side, but more on the little bit has still acid. And it has those beautiful aromas that um, aren't like diverse from here where it's citronella and bug candle like, it's just, it's, it's like another Crayola crayon that I never be able to work with. Unfortunately, I'm sold out of all mine, so I brought a different blend. So I brought two white blends to show the ability to make really interesting things out of blending white wines. And it's not all just like, I'm gonna take whatever's left in the cellar and, and sweeten it up. I try to make some really structured things. So that's why I brought two. 
the troglite Bianco because Cooter Belt Leader plays a role in it. And so that, you know, something that Sarah and I share. The um, Totus Porcus, um, well, that's the only one I had right now. That's Converse Schmeter, Saw Bonk, uh, Riesling, Pinot Gris, a little bit of Chardonnay, and a little bit of Malvasia. And uh, done in large uh, German oak stilts. So just the idea that blends can be as, as beautiful as, as bridal ones. And it seems to be something in this country that we always look down on um, bridal things. Um, but um, when you are growing on the edge, that's the key. And you can build complexity and make some really wonderful things consistently. And Maynard, you do the same thing. You blend quite a bit. I mean, you have wines that like will state varietal and whatnot, but I do see blends in your entire portfolio, both Merkin and Caduceus. Hey, here I am. Uh, part of that is, uh, it was just, again, logistics of what we had in the cellar. Um, and it is, and, and as Sean mentioned, it's, it's, it keeps you versatile. You can actually have, you know, uh, flexibility in the cellar uh, to put a blend together with things that you have and then kind of reallocate things in different directions. But I am finding that as we're dialing in the, in the, some of the sites and as we are getting, uh, deeper roots, uh, older vines. I am kind of shifting quite a few of the blends to be predominantly one grape with a little side dish of, of something else. So it used to be for the Oneste, we were doing Barbera Merlot blend 50-50, but that's actually about 95% Barbera now because our Barbera vines are just killing it. And the Merlot is just kind of there to kind of round it out a little bit. It's really interesting. Sarah, I want to touch base because we did talk to shifting gears a little bit from just the windows into our right or respective areas. And we did talk previously about uh, where we are as these sort of ancillary wine regions, right? None of us are these big three West Coast states. We all have to fight a little bit for market share. And a lot of that fight is an uphill battle. And sometimes it has to do with our neighbors. And I think when we all discuss things, Michigan's just a little bit further ahead in terms of the state a collaborative state effort in an organization, um, lobbying organization, et cetera. Arizona may be like a little bit behind Michigan and then Pennsylvania a little bit behind Arizona. And when you and I spoke, one of the things that we discussed was just the challenges that you were facing being in a state winery, working really hard, focusing on agriculture, and then having um, this sort of being at the beginning, if you will, of what a, a, an emerging region that's about to like really like leap out onto the stage, or at least we hope if your wines are an indication of what we can expect from that. I'm curious of where you see the state of Pennsylvania wine right now and where it could be as you've traveled around and seen these other regions. Um, I think Pennsylvania is still very young. We, I don't think we have figured it out yet. Um, and there's not, I mean, Michigan has a little more structure to its industry. We don't have any of the infrastructure that's in New York or even in Virginia. Um, our state university, Penn State, is, is kind of just working its way into wine. I mean, they're doing some things, but I just, uh, there's plenty of room to progress for Pennsylvania. Um, I think the future is bright because we're a big state and there's opportunities for lots of different varieties to succeed. But overall, there's there's some work to be done. And um, the good news is I think a lot of people are enthusiastic. We have more wine growers and people, you know, committing the funds, the time, all of the effort to grow wine. So I think the future is, is coming. And of course, our commitment to the future is our daughter, Erin, who could have gone anywhere and chose to come back here um, so uh, there are a few other wineries that are like her with second generation, educated, seeing the world coming back. And I think that's what will help propel Pennsylvania to the next level. The new, you know, the new generation of wine growers and winemakers coming in. It's amazing when I talk to you and I hear, like, I heard Erin was seventh generation that sort of blew my mind because I'm thinking like first generation ostensibly, except not all the vineyards, but certainly first generation winery, second generation, Sean's father was a pioneer. Maynard's like first generation. I mean, seventh generation is for one of the younger, I mean, I would say like left on the scene wineries or wine regions. It's astounding that you're seven generations in. I, it's just, it's really impressive. I'm so excited to see how that translates. Well, we're seven generations in farming, only two <laughs> generations in grapes. So um, 
yeah, my husband's family has been farming this land since the 1800s, which is um, pretty remarkable, uh, even in this area where there's a lot of farmers. So um, I think farming is definitely in my family's DNA. We've always grown things and it makes sense that we've transitioned to a new form of farming. And then Sean, your dad was actually the first to plant vinifera on Old Mission Peninsula, so it's the very definition of a pioneer. I'd love for you to just touch base on that, where that was 45 years ago, almost 50 years ago now, I guess. Well, Does that remind yourself of that? I mean, that's one thing I try to remind people is that the American, the North American wine industry is fairly young. I mean, the prohibition pretty much wiped out everything. Um, and when it started anew, there was some, you know, uh, California really didn't get its, um, Speed going until Robert Mondavi and all that started in the late 60s and 70s to raise the real caliber of things, at least in the, in the press and all that, in the wine styles. And if you look at Virginia and Texas and all these places, there's wineries started around the early 70s in most all these places, but we kind of labored in obscurity for a long time. My dad um, tried to buy a winery in Germany and uh, his German friends kind of uh, um, made sure they actually got that beer instead of him, which I totally understand. And um, but he saw a superficial difference or a, a similar similarity at this fruit growing region in the water here to the Rhine. I personally don't see it, but I'm glad that he made that connection because with some help from some Germans and some um, Michelichus and uh, Vince Petrucci and all these experts at the time from out west, they all came up with the idea that it might work, but it might not. <laughs> and so here we are 40, I don't know, 44 years later, whatever it is right now. And um, um, Pretty cool. And that's what made me come back here as uh, I studied over in Germany. But the whole idea to come back to a really beautiful region and be able to make your mark on a really pretty part of the world, it was pretty enticing. I mean, back in the day, for, for many things, was, and farming especially, was not a cool thing to do. I mean, it was kind of like my friends were going off to the Manhattan and making a bundle of money when, in the boom then, and I went back to become a farmer. I mean, it sounds cool now, but it definitely was not back then, but it was the right choice. And Maynard, you were very much a pioneer in Arizona. I know that other, um, I know there were people that had grapes planted prior to, but when you came on the scene, you had mentioned when we talked before that there was some digging out, right? There was some the wines that were coming out of Arizona that weren't nearly the quality level that we're seeing today. And you really pushed through that with perseverance. I'd like to hear your tale of the early. I think, I, th I think a, a lot of it came down to um, the grapes. Uh, I think a lot of, especially like you've seen this kind of happen in, uh, it happened in Texas a little bit in, in New Mexico, but you had uh, a bunch of, you know, oil barons or tech billionaires, whatever in Texas. And they just talked to their marketing people and said, what grow, you know, what sells? Oh, well, Merlot, uh, Chardonnay, Cabernet and Pinot. And they tried to plant all that stuff in Texas. And it was, it's dreadful for the most part. And when they started figuring out that that's not what they should have planted, they started switching to things like Tempranillo. Then it started all kind of making more sense. Uh, and I think that's kind of what I brought, you know, my generation, Todd, you know, Todd and Kelly and, and Kent and um, uh, Stan Reckoner. Uh, we, that's what we kind of brought to the table. We were, we were focusing more on what should be growing here because if I figure out even remotely, even close to what should be growing here, and we get out of our own way and just let that stuff shine, the wines are just going to start singing. And that's kind of what happened. We got, we got out of the way. Um, we paid attention more on the farming rather than the, the cute fluorescent critter on the label. I'll tell you, um, having been there, and it's funny that you're saying, but having been there, I was um, a long time flag waver for Michigan. And I had the pleasure, I think, I don't know how long ago was that? Maybe nine years ago, eight years ago? Oh God. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I think it was like nine something like that wow and because i because just being here in this region i was open-minded and ready and excited to try it and i was just astounded about just the quality that was coming out of arizona and the people that you just mentioned stan reckoner and his white wines the peak pool that he makes in particular yeah. huge riesling fan um it was funny but brian who has a lot of experience with arizona or different experience with arizona he told me before that trip however many years ago that arizona is like Right. When you go from the south to the north, it's like driving across the terrain of three different planets and none of them are Earth. Yeah. <laughs> and every time I think when I'm talking about Arizona wines to my staff, I think about that. And I think that has a huge impact in the viticulture, too, because it's very much like with Michigan and how different our terrain is, like the southeast, the southwest and our peninsulas up here. 
they're all completely different wine regions. And I'm curious, like, how do you see the differences within our own state coming together as like a cohesive unit in order to propel us? It's a political division, honestly. I mean, no. well, no, I mean, uh, in the sense that where they put the border uh, between Toledo and Detroit, um, we are Michigan the size of. So, like, Slovenia and Friuli? Well, yeah, but uh, you can fit Slovenia, Friuli, and probably four other countries into Michigan. That's the thing. We're a large, large area. So, to, to have the, the similarities are the, the influence of Lake Michigan, but that doesn't count people in the southeast and all that. I just. I just kind of focus on our two peninsulas, and I don't. I, I think that's more important than the whole Michigan as a whole thing, honestly. So you're focusing more intuitively on this particular area. The only way I can think of it. Well, when, when you think about our area, it's not an area; it's a bunch of little tiny areas, like two and five acres, and ten acres maybe if you're lucky. Even I think the largest vineyard around here is forty, maybe fifty. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's there's not a lot of expansive land to plant. So we're trying to find these little pockets hillsides that can work so it's um it's hard enough to focus on old mission or lelana or old mission and lelana together let alone what's going on downstate um, and i think part of what is important and that i saw happening i i got up here in the mid 90s so i'm kind of lobbying on to the second generation of grape growers with sean um it was investment in the vineyard like maynard is saying like we're in a kind of a flurry of let's try everything uh, in the late 90s and see what what will grow, what will take. Um, and you had different people leading different tracks in that sense. And then getting to the point now where we have not an understanding of what we have to grow as in like some kind of ground crew model, but in the sense that here's what's working currently for what we're after. And then we can experiment on the sides a little bit, but honing in on a bit of cultural practice. And whether that's, you know, starts with canopy management, all that now down to like floor management, looking at soil health and trying to get plants that want to be here, want to thrive here and give them that opportunity. At the same time, that investment in the winery um, and having the equipment and personnel to take all of that work in the vineyard and bring it forward. And that's a, it's a generational process to get there. Well, and Sarah, when we talked earlier, you two mentioned that you were like, you had you in deep Pennsylvania, and then you had your southern neighbors, right? The southern producers. So do you find that there's a cohesiveness between your northern, and I don't know how many people are around you, or if you could just describe what Pennsylvania looks like in terms of collaboration, and I would say also geography. Um, so because um, we're, we're located north of the Blue Mountain, um, a lot of people south of the mountain look upon us as another country, <laughs> uh, even though we're not, <laughs> and also as though we're far, far away. Um, so there's that barrier. The mountain isn't a mountain. It's a small hill. It's about 1,500 feet, but it's enough to... <laughs> I think it's a mountain right now. <laughs> it's a small hill, but um, that's a geographic barrier for a lot of um, Pennsylvanians to come north of the mountain. And we're just on the other side, we're three or four miles north of it. Um, and south of the mountain is where there's a few more wineries, more population, um, Allentown, the Lehigh Valley, and then uh, further south, an hour and a half from us is Philadelphia. So there's a lot of hesitation to come on the other side of the mountain. I know that sounds crazy, but it's really true. And um, there's also more wineries in that area than there are here. Um, we're a little cooler. Um, the mountain actually is high enough to change our temperature and affect our weather, good and bad. So in hurricane years, we may miss the big hurricanes and everyone south gets them. But in the polar vortices years, we may get the cold air and they don't. So it's, it's kind of a trade. It, it does have multiple effects on us. Um, but we, there, our closest neighbor is actually a winery that here in Pennsylvania, you don't have to grow grapes. You can bring in juice from anywhere anywhere in the US and um, label it and sell it here. So um, 
we don't, the neighbors that grow are further away from us and south of us. And we're gonna unpack that concept in just a few minutes. I'm glad that you brought it up. I wanna just discuss elevation because we're talking when you say the mountain, it's 1500 feet. Yeah. <laughs> I would love Maynard to just discuss elevation. I think of the Judith Vineyard as opposed to like the Cornville properties. And then but you also just both points what we were talking about here, you have the Buell Memorial Vineyard, right? So you you have a big vineyard down south in Wilcock, as well as your vineyard holdings up north. I'm curious what you think about that collaboration statewide among producers, in addition to the discussion about elevation. Oh yeah, oh, the Southern Arizona Vineyard is at about 4,300 feet, but it's elevated, it's like an elevated playa. So you have mountain ranges all around us. So all that erosion kind of filling in this valley floor and there's kind of a water a table in there, but you have the Dosca Basis Mountains, you have the Chiricahuas all kind of circling that entire area. So a lot of the water uh, comes off those mountains and kind of goes into that area. In fact, some of it actually turns into a lake uh, during monsoons. Um, but, you know, it's pretty high up, 4,300 4, feet, but it's fairly level. So it's as far as farming, um, it's, it's, uh, it's easy as far as getting equipment in and, and you know, doing, doing, uh, doing the tilling, uh, if we're doing tilling uh, initially to plant or just weed management uh, coming through and cutting things. Um, it's great. Uh, Northern Arizona, most of my sites are, it's way more mountainous up here in terms of just the, just everywhere, uh, the terrain. So uh, the Judith Vineyard is at 4,900 feet and, and, and the grade on that is uh, insane grade. Like it's, you know, it's one-to-one, -one. It's, it's nuts. Um, down in Cornville, uh, right near us, uh, I have 30 acre site uh, called Elefante and Oak Creek circles that completely around it. So it's kind of like this little knoll up in the middle of, a, of, of where a creek kind of cut its way down. So a lot of volcanic influence in that area. We have a lot of limestone. Um, the Verde Valley is, was, uh, you know, the, Arizona was under an ocean. So definitely the, the Verde Valley had, um, had that line, has that limestone influence uh, from having been an ocean, uh, um, ancient seabed. But there were volcanoes erupting under the water. So you have all this crazy stratification happening with those volcanoes not quite becoming islands. They were just kind of stratifying under that, under that water. So you have all this crazy mining all of the state, you know, copper and gold mines, all of the state. So uh, the influence just geologically is, um, you know, all the buzzwords you hear from the best regions in, in, uh, in uh, Italy and, and France, um, limestone and, and volcanic influence. But up north, crazy hills, complete diversity between 3,300 and 5,000 feet we're farming. It's all over the map. Very difficult to farm, but worth it. Yeah, it's, it's extraordinary. I mean, but I mean, it's amazing. Like Judith, literally, is like being in El shade in terms of the grade of the vineyard. It's just so steep, you know. And then it's just it's, it's an interesting place to be for sure. It's one of those things you you can go to the gym and you can work out, uh, and you think you're in shape, and then you walk through the vineyard and you think you're gonna die. <laughs> it's yeah. Uh, so I want to shift gears a little bit from just the respective growing regions, and I want to talk generally about consumer focus and consumer education and buyer education, because I think I see it just as a buyer and an educator. We were sort of at this, eight, we have two generations happening right now, right? We have what I would like to refer to as like the vintage buyer, right? If I've never heard of it, if I don't know it, it can't possibly be good. Or if it's expensive, it must be good, right? And then we have this, um, this, we'll call it the nouveau buyer, the person that's kind of coming up and learning. And I think it's open-minded and full of the spirit of adventure. And sometimes yes, sometimes no, understands good wine. Like sometimes a re-ferment is considered good because it's weird, which we know is not true, it's flawed. But I respect so much the open-mindedness of that buyer slash consumer. So we're talking about being here in Michigan, Pennsylvania, Arizona, emergent wine regions, um, as developed as we may be in our own right, how do you communicate with each of those consumers slash buyers and really put your wines up there? Because I don't, I mean, just because it's not Napa doesn't, it doesn't mean it isn't great. And I'd like to start with Maynard only because we talked about Malbec in particular. And so many of these wine categories have become brands. Argentinian Malbec, right? Freely and Pinot Grigio, Napa Valley Cabernet. You have so much in common with Argentina, yet overall, pound for pound, the quality of the wine that's coming out of Arizona, not that there isn't extraordinary wine coming out of Argentina, 
for what people know isn't the highest of the quality of Argentina. And you have great wine. I just want to start there with you because we started that conversation earlier. Yeah, it's. A, I mean, there's, there's. We could go on for hours about some of the some of the subcategories on how it's going to how you can get to a consumer, um, and that the education is is important. I think we are kind of lucky in that there has been a complete movement um, uh, back towards the more old world making of wines and more older older school approaches because I think. You know, in the, the true American way, Mountain Dew is king, Coca Cola is king queen. Um, you know, it's it's it, you know the there are palettes are destroyed. Um, I could go on again. I can go on for hours about how, you know, depression and just uh you know, defaulting, forgetting how to grow your own food. Like there's a whole there's a whole day of that we could talk about. But I think what we've done is we've kind of connected. Um, with the people who are watching that movement go back away from uh, the the um, jammy, high alcohol, over oaked wines, because they're finding now some of those beautiful 98 point, 100 point wines from Australia in 98, 97, they just aren't holding up. Um, and I think I told you guys the the example, and this is, you know, there's a you know, Rajat Par, uh, and you know, the the just that you know, that balance, looking for balance in those wines, something ageable. We're lucky because that movement is kind of happening just as we were getting going. And it just happens to be the kind of wines that I gravitate to. I, I opened up, can I talk about the, the Penfolds wines that I opened up? You did to Sean and I, but I, not to the group, and you should. Okay. And if I could yeah, so, do that, your, uh, the Garnacha we're tasting is 13.4. Yeah, 13.4. I like domestic red from a wine time that is very low alcohol. Yeah. So I opened up, we had a, you know, we had an absolute, I don't know what we were thinking, but we opened up uh, out of my cellar. I had a, a three, uh, three pen, four Penfolds wines. I opened up, I opened up a, a Penfolds Grange 1955, 1982. And then we opened up the bin 60, a, uh, a total unicorn Penfolds wine, uh, from 1962, uh, and a, a bin seven, also a unicorn wine. And we were tasting them. And, you know, these are, these are 70 year old wines. These are, you know, very old every year and they were drinking beautifully. So the geeks in us, we couldn't help it. We had to run in the lab and test the wine to see where the pH and TA and the alcohol levels and everything were. The VA was completely intact. It was in, it was in a good spot. The pH was around 3, 8, 3, 7, 3, 9. The TA was about 0. 0.7, 0. 0.6. Uh, and the alcohols were 11, 8. 12.2. Did you have to so, know what they were bottling? Did you know what they were labeling time? Did they have ABV, ABV on the label? Oh, uh, I'm sorry, what? Did they have ABV on the label? And did you happen to know the difference between what it was labeled at versus what it was seven years later? Oh, it was, it was, it was pretty much spot on with what the label said. So they weren't really hiding any of that. But my, I guess my point is like, these are 70 year old wines and they're drinking beautifully. And they're from an area of the world you, you just associate with extreme big huge jammy sun-baked wines and uh that was not the case at all they were clearly picked at like 22 and a half bricks uh in the in the sweet spot and i think for for arizona yeah we'll get into that anyway educating people is to show them that that bin 60a uh sold for at auction for uh like 15 grand something ridiculous uh for that bottle of wine because it's still drinking well um, it was picked very early. So I don't know, I'm picking, I'm picking earlier because I feel like the sun is your friend until it's not. And we want ageable wines that are, comp uh, that are competing with these historic benchmarks. So I guess that's what I'm swinging for the fence. My friends are being a little more cautious, but we're all on the same page. We're trying to make delicious, ageable uh, wines without chasing scores and without chasing those things. So I think that's part of the education is that we're trying to, we're trying to go for quality over yeah, quality. You're not trying to make expensive goods, right? Yeah. You're not yeah. 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 Log and hitting it out. You know, you're actually making intentional lines for the region. Yeah. And I think I want to talk to you guys for a second. Um, and Brian, if you want, you have done a lot with white varieties up here that you don't see as much. Now we're seeing a little bit more, but I think Tanner 
right? You started that, you've done other things. I just want to hear, like, your evolution has been interesting because you also moved into other things like Spider and that. Well, yeah, and some of it came from my time in Arizona when in the early 90s and working in a tasting room and winery when people were coming in, we were pouring a French columbar and, and um, we had Riesling that was interesting. Um, and coming up here, I, I love white wines. And so like seeking out what we had up here, but then in this period of time in like from 95 to 2002 really where there was a, a lot of investment going into new vineyards and people coming up to what should I plant um, and that question mark about we don't really we know we can do a couple things well but let's try some things so um, experimentation on somewhat other people's dime in a way but it's kind of mutually involved in it um, has led to some interesting results and fortunately you know up here our white wine spectrum is, is there's a somewhat of a safe range in there that you can work with. Um, I feel like we we have this link to Riesling, which is important and valued, and I love our ability to to grow Riesling in, in, in its variety of styles. Um, but we got in with Pinot Blanc, um, looking at Kerner. Um, Gewürztraminer has potential if we could just get a market for it. Um, I think it's a difficult grape to sell. Um, has allowed us this a little bit more of a flexibility. And I think one of the varieties that I'm very excited about is Oxala um, because of its blending potential. And Maynard's talking about blending. Um, and Sean, when we realize that sometimes we can utilize some of these other grapes to help bolster the varietal character or maybe drop some flavors. And so Oxo is bringing us a low acidity, early ripening grape, which again, great for the farm because our risks go down a little bit in terms of the extended uh, nature of the season or having to extend the season. Um, it's given us a chance to plump some things up, even in very small doses, not unlike Alsace um, and how they use it. Um, and now this Pinot Blanc that we're tasting here does not have um, Oxo in it because it's single vineyard, but our other Pinot Blanc, I use them about 8%, and it really can help to kind of just build a little bit of mid, mid palate, which can sometimes help make sense of the acidity that we get. Um, and so the more that we're developing these vineyards and seeing their signatures, and whether that's going towards still wines or oak aged or sparkling, um, I'm finding we have that versatility of the blend um, in very tiny doses um, in most cases to, to help I guess help make sense of some of, of our viticulture up here. Do you think that your willingness to experiment with varieties that aren't like, you know, those that begin with the letter C, do you think that that has endeared you to this younger generation of buyers who are willing to be a little bit more experimental? Accidentally, yes. Um, we were sort of obstinate in the early days about just doing it because we wanted to see what would happen. And we wanted, we always, like Sean was, you know, instrumental in this with me is let's go to other regions, whether it's wine regions or cities or whatever, and be able to walk into a room and just have our wines on the table and not have to describe, oh, well, that's good for Michigan or, oh, that, hey, nice job. That was pretty cute. You're, you know, you're, you're coming along, kid. You can hang in there kind of thing. And so um, by having varieties that are not necessarily in the you know, big nomenclature, um, it, it gives the wine a chance to talk and not us. And so we can be like, yeah, here's a kerner. Oh, really? Okay. And then they taste it, and they're thinking about that wine, not about the, you know, the, the the all the gods before them that have come and have laid down what it should taste like. And so they have the wine has a chance to talk. And that's it's important. It's funny because that speaks to we spoke earlier. Mayor was like, oh, it's the bait and switch, which we had to do earlier on, right? And I do that in my restaurant all the time. It's the bait and switch. Like you want to. What do you want? Oh, are you describing me a wine that you want? And you think that you want Malbec, or you think that you want Cabernet. Well, I'm going to bring you three bottles. I'm going to give you a taste of each, and you tell me which one you like the most. And that's how I sell so much of the <laughs> Nagual de Naga, right? Because it's funny. Um, but I do want to like just jump back for a second as we talked about that. Um, but we know that Cabernet and Chardonnay have, by and large, been the go-to wines for the vintage generation of wine drinker, wine buyer, wine seller, all the things. You could put Pinot Noir in a secondary category, but really for most domestic consumers, it is Chardonnay and Cabernet. And Sarah, 
I want you to just maybe, if you were to pick, if those varieties are non-existent as far as the emergent wine consumer is concerned, what are the varieties that you think are, will be top of mind and of those, which are you growing? Hmm. That's a really good question. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I don't know that I ever thought about it in that context. Um, you brought up a couple. You said like what you're growing, like Gruner and Gewurz. And we grow Gruner, Gewurz, and Riesling. So, I mean, those are the varieties that I'm comfortable with trying to get someone to try that thinks all Riesling is sweet and all Gewurz Traminer is sweet. And how do you say Gruner Vetliner? So, I mean, those are varieties that... Just like you just did. <laughs> it <was beautiful. laughs> yeah, Vetliner. So, um, yeah, those are the varieties that... But, I mean, you pose a really interesting question because there are so many varieties away from Cabernet Sauvignon and Chardonnay that I think for an emerging wine region, that's the way to approach it. We're not those varieties. We are something really special. And the name is secondary, try the wine first. Um, and then we can talk about what the name is or what the varieties are to get people maybe less afraid because I know Gewurz, people see Gewurztraminer and they're afraid to try it because of many reasons. The first usually being they can't say it <laughs> to ask for it. So yeah, I, I, I like your approach that try and take away this, the stigma of one or well, the two famous varieties and, and look at anything that might be possible, particularly um, for us, Gruner, Gewurz and Riesling. Um, we also grow a little Cab Franc um, and the, the red German bastards. We just planted Blau Frankish, yay, and the bastard. <laughs> So, yeah. Well, and me, Sean, you want to say something? Yeah, sure. I mean, there's there's two, for, I mean, for a young wine region, there's two principles going, like Maynard touched on about vine age. So whatever you started out with, or in our case, uh, and my fixation has been dry Riesling and my father's uh, Gamay Noir. If you're really good at it and you plan the vineyards at the right place and uh, take care of them, and they get a certain amount of age on them and experience with them. If you stick at something really for a long time, people will eventually hopefully will figure it out. And we're lucky we're living in a post gatekeeper age with the, the internet and whatnot um, that we don't have a couple uh, sources to tell you whether you should try this wine or not. And in some cases, it leads to um, experimentation for the sake of experimentation and some really strange wines. But I'd rather take that any day over the previous days when I always had to justify making wine in Michigan. Now it's actually an interesting thing. Um, I always use my organizational principle. I started out winemaking in Germany where Riesling was king. Um, and then I kind of drifted more into Austria and then I kind of ended up in Southern Austria. And now I'm kind of in a whole, I guess I like to wander around the Austria or the Holy Roman Empire and my winemaking techniques. The Holy Roman Empire. Yeah. I see a label coming on. Yeah, day. so, uh, the but the funny thing is you also have to be able to change. And when I was younger, I was, I was really kind of not on the forefront of the red wine movement in this area. I thought um, our area could handle Gamay uh, and Blau Frankish and these kind of medium body reds, you know, Petit Rouge, if anybody smuggled it in, you know, those kind of <laughs> things. But um, I wasn't really, uh, I thought Cabernet Franc was an utter disaster. And all of a sudden I started a new winery where that was one of the most planned things we had. And I just figured it out by, um, Part of it is confidence. I don't need to make big bombs of wine. Just because Cabernet Franc has Cabernet in the name does not mean that it has to be like Cabernet Sauvignon light. It be more like we made like Pinot, like those beautiful light uh, Cabernets of Francs that are made up in the water. Like, like this Garnacha, I would argue, has that same kind for of the, For how big Garnacha can be, yeah, yeah it's a restrained style. Totally and that's strange. where these, where we have, um, we can enter the conversation. The other, but when I talk about, you know, experience of what's going on in Europe or older regions and all that, I don't mean just directly aping their styles, but there are solutions that people have figured out. I mean, over, I mean, I'm not that vain to think that I have to figure everything out on my own. There's been things, you know, over you know, thousands of years of all wine history that we can learn from. An example would be we make a wine called Bestiary Red, which is a blend of 50-50 of Ocrine and Gamay. Our Ocrine vines are fairly young, they're very tannic, they got some nice berry notes and all that, but it's almost, it's a, if I have to spend six years in the barrel before it was uh, drinkable to the average Joe. Um, in uh, in Sintirol, or Alta Aja, however you want to call it, is um, they blend something called Trollinger or Schiava into it. It's a light, you know, uh, not very tannic red that softens it up and makes it really, the, 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 together they make a great blend. 
I don't want to grow trolling or skiava, but I have gamay noir, and that plays the same role as a uh, trolling or so I've done something uniquely new because I took variety, the French variety, and then uh, the traditionally um, uh, Northern Italian or Southern um, put together, and, and it works really well. And, I, and these are things that I think some really cool things can happen on the edges uh, on wine regions like ours because these are the areas. When you look at all the interesting regions in Europe, it's always the ones that are bordering mountains or get a little bit cold. You know, you, got, you, know, you have you know, the, from Friuli through Slovenia to uh, Steiermark to Hungary, around in parts of Germany, and then even you wrap all the way around in the Loire oh, Valley yeah, and yeah, Bordeaux yeah. and, you know, the Pyrenees, and that's where cool stuff happens. You know, I also want to mention one other thing, and kind of what you were saying, is you're willing to, like, change tack as needed. And when Maynard and I talked before, one of the things that really struck me that you said was, be wrong. Like, it's so, like, you have to accept the fact, you have to be willing to be wrong, right? You're in this sort of pioneering wine region, and that's okay. And, well, I think... And I just so often consumers see whether it's a chef or whomever or a winemaker is like this celebrity. You don't go into making wine to be a celebrity, right? It's just too damn hard, right? So it's you don't go into making wine because it's something that you love. It's this beautiful mix of science and art and whatever else. And one of the things you said was be wrong. Like when you're in this emerging wine region and you have to do things, you have to be willing to persevere. You have to be willing to like dig your way uphill and you have to be willing to change tack when you know that you haven't nailed this particular decision. Well, you have to sail over the edges of the earth to know where the edge of the earth is a little bit, but don't do it too often. <laughs> you know, that's what uh, Tom Rogelio advised me. He's like, go so far that you go over the edge, know where it is, and then dial it just right next to it. Have a good advice. grappling hook, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> have a good grappling hook. So in that vein, and as we kind of draw to a close, one of the things I really want to discuss is collaboration. And I think we all talk, we've talked about what within our individual states we do. But I, it's like to me being like the you manage systems, not people, right, person. As I sit here, we all have these individual states that have done things, that have succeeded, that haven't succeeded. We're reinventing ourselves a little bit right now, just with changes in government in the state of Michigan. I feel like when I look at Arizona, I look at Pennsylvania, I look at other wine regions, why do we reinvent the wheel every time? Is there a way that we can work together as sort of marginal wine regions where we can learn from each other and grow, even though we might be different? And I completely understand the value of being cohesive within the individual state, but I also feel we have a lot to learn from each other. And I just, from each of you, starting with Sarah, I'd like to know, how do you, do you, do you think I'm crazy? Or do you see that as a way forward for all of us to sort of elevate each other? Sounds like we're the animal house fraternity. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's definitely a way to move forward because we are lesser known. And I think united, we're stronger than separate. Um, and there's, there's, a, there's common ground. I mean, when you're in, a, in an emerging or new region, there's a lot of things to discover and a lot of things to go wrong. So sharing those experiences and, and you know, listening to what other regions have done and how things have worked for them or not, sometimes you learn more from your mistakes than you do from success. Um, that's a big opportunity. That's probably the biggest reason why I was excited to do this other than, of course, all of you. <laughs> it's always a joy to talk with other winemakers and hear about and taste what's going on because, you know, if, and sometimes in Pennsylvania, I we drink a lot of other wine, but I, it's a little isolating here, so it's really special that you invited me and I could be here. But I think there is room for collaboration, even though we're across states and, as Brian said, many inner states. Um, there's there's room to work together, um, and and that's a that's an exciting challenge and something to try and figure out and look forward to. Nina, you know your thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I think I think uh, if you're gonna. Each region is going to have uh, limitations and strengths, uh, as we've discussed. But I think, I get, maybe it's the Irish guy in me. But um, you know, kind of looking at the negative stuff first. That's you know, that's what we Irish do. Uh, but figuring out what your limitations are, right? If you understand what your limitations are, um, like for example, you know, there's there's a bunch of things that I just I just can't do. I mean, there's things a lot of things I can do. Like you know, I could have. I could have gone and played for the NBA. Uh, I just decided not to. I'm not in denial about that. I saw um, you in Travis, man. You were awesome. You know, 
So just understanding your limitations and not being in denial about those limitations. And because some of the limitations in your state are going to translate to other, to other states, other elevations, other soil types. Um, so I feel like you almost have to like come from, all, from a negative point of view first and just kind of see what those things are. And then, yes, as soon as you share them, a light's going to go off in somebody's brain uh, in another state where they saw just like Sean describing the extended uh, Great Lakes area, you guys started seeing similarities. Yeah. So you'll, you'll start to see the similarities, start to see the differences. It's just, it will, my old teacher in, in Michigan, uh, God rest his soul. Um, you know, it's always, always beat us uh, over the head with, um, you know, uh, an intelligent person is somebody who learns from experience, but not just his own. He learns from other people's experience. Yeah, it's brilliant. It's like learning as much what not to do as what to do. Yeah. As you're doing things. Um, Brian, your thoughts just on that collaboration, possibly in the state? Well, I'm, I'm getting enthused by the what's happening a little bit in not just in the distribution world, but in the, the world of the people that are making decisions now to purchase wine and having this ability to open up and think about what they want for their restaurant or their facility and um, where they're, they're shop to, to represent um, a range of wines. And, and knowing that they have these options, it's tough as small producers to get out there and be represented um, because we don't, we can't facilitate these normal models of, of what has been executed in the wine industry. Um, but when you start to get this conversation going, people start thinking about it and that we've seen it with small distributors trying to find regions um, that they can bring together to have a, a wider, you know, array of colors in their plume and say, hey, look, I've got this, and this, we got some cool stuff happening um, from all over. And it doesn't have to be um, a group of Michigan guys going out and say, we're going to go hit the market and hammer this thing. I mean, we, we can do that on our own, but if we can be within a whole book of, of wines that have that kind of that different perspective going on. I think it, that's also going to help drive the understanding from the people we're trying to talk to that um, wine has personality, has something to say, and it has, it's coming from somewhere. That's actually a perfect segue. We do have to kind of wrap it up, but I wanted to just tie in this concept. We had a couple of questions that came through that were a far bigger uh, thing that we could to undertake this evening. But just to say it's exactly what Brian said, and what I find is that these uh, it has to do with homogeny and, you know, why can't, you know, these regions can do consistency year after year. I'm like, well, that's kind of wine by chemistry set, right? So when you're working on vintage variation and when you're in regions where you have monsoons and slash frosts in the fall or the spring or challenging rains or here, in some cases, I think 14 and 15, like completely being frozen out, we can't make the same exact wine from year after year. But what we do, and I mean, like the collective we is we make if you're doing it with integrity, you make the best wine that you can from what you're given from the vintage. And to me, that's the great difference, right? That's, that's, we don't need to be homogenous. I love that 14 is different from 17. I love that 19 is, would be different from 21. And if 20 didn't exist, it didn't exist. I think we would all be happy if that were the case. But truly, like I think in terms of, um, that's what's special about our viticultural regions on the edge is that we do have that vintage variation, not like Europe. And consumers, buyers looking for that homogeny that they can get out of the brand wines like Argentinian Malbec, Prosecco, New Zealand Salt Blanc, right? That's not wine, right? I mean, that's why my chemistry set. And okay, you can have your case stacks at all the box stores and whatever else, and that's great. But to me, wine is much more something that's fluid and changes and it's like personalities and people and it's more interesting if it has to struggle. And that's what I love about everything that's here. And having been in this region for as many years as I have, having had the great opportunity to be in Arizona, Sarah, I will come visit you, but your wines intrigue me every time. I just, they blew my mind when you were here for City of Riesling and I'm so glad that you were willing and able to come on. And if anyone has any last thoughts, I would love to hear them. Um, we are wrapping up. Anyone that wants to stay on a little bit longer, by all means, you're more than welcome. We have a finger. Sarah, any last thoughts? My finger too. Um, uh, just my pleasure. And it's, all of these wines were so delicious. I, I'm not sure which one I want to drink first. Um, I've imagined food with all of them, which is 
that's the best when I drink a wine and think about what I'm going to have with it. Um, yeah, thank you so much for having me. And it's a privilege to represent deep Pennsylvania. And well done, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> I would say uh, the thing that we have. <laughs> I think you can't talk. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Michael we, says hi. They all start out um, east of the you know, Rockies. If you start out uh, bringing tanker truck lines in and be a one stop shopper for every kind of line, and the, maybe on the edge of a highway, and you're able to get a, uh, not to get a class C license because you qualify as a winemaker. That's the beginning of the wine industry. But what, where we are at right now is the confidence. And confidence comes partly from what Maynard's saying about knowing the frame of the, what you can do, the negatives. Uh, we have high acids up here, or not high acids, but acids play a, a role in our wines. So why fight it? Lean into it and become really good at managing those acids. And if our reds have a little bit of acidity, find those regions in the world that embrace that and learn from them a little bit. And that's where I think the big changes happen from all this being in for a while not apologizing and automatically from coming from a region going, I don't need to appeal to everybody. If I can just get one slice of a slice of a slice of a pie, I can't, make, I can't make enough wine for that. And those are people I want to sell wine to and talk to anyway, so I don't need to appeal to everybody. And that comes from confidence, also not using uh, sugar or oak or things in excess to the point where the wines aren't balanced anymore. Make wines that are a little edgy. Um, thank God for the hipster generation, like bitter and, uh, and astringent things now, like make orange wines that are interesting. It's a very great time for to be a non-traditional area to grow wine. It was never like this growing up. We had to fight for every placement, every restaurant thing. And it's so much easier right now. And the people that do sell it and they are, are enthusiasts. They do it with passion. We and then they're friends, too. Yeah. Yeah. Man, what he just said reminded me of the quote that you said when we were talking from the lab. Um, if you try to please generally, you don't. Oh yeah, Stendhal. Uh, the more one pleases generally, the less one pleases profoundly. And brilliant, but that's exactly kind of what you were just saying. Yeah, I'll, I'll give Stendhal the, uh, the yeah, I'm I'm on, yeah. Uh, love, I'm on. yeah, yeah. Yeah, but it was a brilliant quote, and I think it was exactly what you were just saying. Um, anything to add to that, Maynard? Um, no, I think it's other than the really birds, is... obviously your guests. Yeah. Freckles with the broken leg. Um, no, I, th I, th I th uh, a lot of it is is uh, we kind of grew up in a generation where you're supposed to take over the entire world with whatever the thing is you're doing. You don't have to do that. Just do the right thing. Uh, live within your means. Produce within your means. To, uh, talk to the audience that's willing to listen, and uh, don't be in a hurry. Last word, my friend, co-host. No, let's make that the last <laughs> word. I yeah. Thank you. I can't tell you how much we appreciate you guys being on. We really want to elevate our respective wine regions. Little Birdie, you are loved. With or without your broken mind, may you succeed in life. Yeah. <laughs> Cheers, Peace. you guys. Thank you so much. You know, if you have to go, we get it. If not, I know there are a few questions that might pour in. If not, we'll just. I'm fine. I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna put her away because she needed a little massage there. Sorry. She's just cold. Cool. Sarah, thank, thank you so very much. Really, my pleasure. It really was so great to see your face again after seeing Yeah. You. Are you guys, will there be a city of Riesling? Next year. Yeah, now that COVID, now that we can gather, for sure. Nice. Yeah, Oregon, Oregonians are bothering us to come here, so we want to see them. So, and we're catching on, man. Yeah. yeah, I know. It's like, we're like the, well, like a Minutemen concert back when. <laughs> No one showed up to them, you know, but that's cool because everybody there starts their own bands and there we go. <laughs> so anyone that's like on, not on, we're not going to open it up for like general discussion, but you can continue to watch our conversation if you're voyeuristic in that way. Um, oh, good. It's Madeline. Well, then Madeline can be on. I'd love to see her. Can we introduce our friend Madeline Trafant? She's my friend, <laughs> mentor, one of my favorite women on the entire planet Earth. Hello. <laughs> You're here. Can, video? Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, I was lurking in the background. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. We're so honored you joined us. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Oh, absolutely. I wasn't planning on being on video. I just got, I right, I rushed back from the YMCA to get on this so I could listen to well, you Well, black t-shirts are the end thing, if you look you at know. it. Uh, well, then I've been perpetually in because that's all I wear. So there you sure. have it. It was very nice to hear your, um, your conversation. And for whatever it's worth, you know, don't worry about a damn thing. There are enough of us out here who can't wait to see what you're going to do next. If we'll just call it Gewurz, not Gewurz Dreamer. And if uh, if we can sell, you know, Bestiere Ramado successfully to Plum Market, Bloomfield Township, I think you can just relax. <laughs> you know? And we can, right? Uh, we put it on our spring sale, Sean, just because I thought, you know, good. <laughs> Why not? And I can't wait to see what's coming um, from, uh, you know, the high plains and uh, the, the, the hillsides that I know I can't climb, but I can wave at all y'all in Arizona while you, uh, while you scale them. Are your wines um, in Michigan? Uh, yeah. Um, good luck. Uh, Amanda, who are we with? <laughs> Eagle Eye. Yeah. Eagle Eye. Cool. Then, yeah. um, and, and Sarah, how about your wines? I don't, I'm embarrassed to tell you, I don't remember tasting Pennsylvania wine in, in, in recent memory. It doesn't mean I have in, in the past, but um, you know, you're not, thus far, uh, you know, it's not um, a wide, wide outstate distribution, correct? Correct, we're not, no, we only sell, we have some distribution in DC, Maryland, Virginia, and then of course, Pennsylvania. I would be happy to pick you up. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. <laughs> I just did a how to train your sales rep seminar for them and they didn't pay me yet, so I feel like I can like leverage that. So we can just pick up some Galen. You know what you tell your sales right. rep? You just bring, real, you know, to A, learn how to get excited about something and B, just bring that. I mean, at the end of the day, um, that's, you know, I think a lot of times people put, um, intellectual barriers between um, the source and uh, the end game, which is the consumer. And I really believe in the consumer. I truly do. I've spent my entire professional life, you know, serving them. And if I believe in something and I make it easy for them, as long as it's not, there isn't something about it that um, um, will repel them, <laughs> you know, I can usually midwife it. Um, so you know, if uh, there are enough of us out here, and I'm an older generation, I'm a village elder, so a lot of the, the younger sommeliers, I refuse to say some, I like the word sommelier, you know, um, will be ambassadors for, for all y'all. Brian, it's good to see you. You too, Madeline. Do you, do you feel like um, there's any kind of changing tide from customer perspective? Like, we, we were out for the first time in a mm -hmm. year at Amanda's restaurant, and... Mm -hmm. It was one of those, we were a little bit uh, frazzled because we hadn't been dining in a while. And mm -hmm. uh, the server came up and asked, you know, what, what we're looking at with the wine. I just said, what are you excited about? You know, do you, do you see that customers are willing to kind of just open themselves up yet? Or does it still take more? Um, Oops, I just, did I just lose you? Hold on. Are you there? There you are. I wouldn't, you know, don't worry about a thing. I don't think there are any generalizations. First of all, we're coming off an extraordinary year by anybody's measure, and we're all making it up as we go along. People are thrilled to be out and about. You know, I think the biggest, and Amanda can speak to this, where as far as restaurants go, you know, it's going to be a while before people can, you know, um, uh, maybe invest significantly in anything beyond their by the glass program you know i mean some people um you know are having a hard time uh, reopening but no i think that i think the biggest problem if it is a problem if you want to look at it like a challenge and it and it and it fascinates the hell out of me is the young demographic you know it's such an easy reach for a cocktail or a beer and getting wine in their hands you know and i think frankly, the more cutting edge or lawless it is, good, you know, as long at the end of the day, if um, it's delicious and it, and you know, it bears sensory examination. I mean, I don't drink wine through my mind. You know, I, I filter it through my mind if it passes the, the, the question, is this good wine? Uh, Amanda, would you agree with that as far as, you know, um, your you restaurant floor? 
20 years ago, I think you said, is a good wine? And that's always the first question, right? right. Mm -hmm. Is it a good wine? And then you can take it anywhere from there. But that's Anywhere. Question. You can take it anywhere. I mean, honest to God, people put so many barriers. Don't worry about a damn thing. You Just know, make doesn't it to be good for $60, good for Michigan, good for Arizona, good for $100? Is it just good wine, period? Yeah, it doesn't matter what the Yes. <laughs> no, right. Exactly. I will say price point does matter, especially with the young generation. People have to get this. You know, you soar upwards of 40 bucks, you're going to come to a screeching halt. These are people who are wildly educated and want the best. They want hip, but they're paying off, you know, staggering um, debt in terms of uh, coming off of school, you know, young professionals, even if they're coming out of school and getting a killer job. So the more, in my opinion, that you can make exciting things accessible uh, under 40. But the other thing I wanted to mention to you, because I asked a lot of people in preparation for this, and of course it's an hour, so I have my gazillion things that I'd like to do, <laughs> and I just let the conversation kind of go. Um, if we had all day, one of the things that my deputy beverage director said, she said, honestly, and we sell a ton of like the Caduceus, not well the Naga, because that's one of the ones that's available to us mm -hmm. here. We sell all the, all the quote unquote weird things. Mm -hmm. Not for the, because they're weird, they're all good wines. We also sell a lot of the conventional stuff, but she sells the story before she even sells the wine. The trust factor is there because they know the they know what's behind it. They know the training, they know the mm -hmm. education, they know that we're not gonna slum it and just sell them garbage wine because they feel like right. this is what we wanna sell. She talks, she says, she sells the story. And it's even with um, a different- I hope she sells a short story. That's the only thing I would say. Yeah, you know, I'm, a, <laughs> I'm always looking at it through the eyes of the customer. Yeah. <laughs> 25 words or fewer. It doesn't have yeah, to be right. that much. No, right. It's as quick as, and one of the things after you actually yesterday, she was like, it's Monday. Well, let's say, let's say it's Monday. So I think it was Saturday. She said, uh, because we were talking about Argentina and how Arizona is so similar to Argentina. And I remember that, didn't remember that. And I was talking that, I was talking it through with Kristen. And she literally had someone that came in and asked for Malbec. And she's like, what do you like about Malbec? I was like, I don't know, I just like Malbec. She's like, okay, well, you know what she said? I'm just going to study this. She goes, well, it's a similar climate to Argentina. It has nothing to do with Malbec, but it's delicious. Literally, like she just after that conversation and sold them a bottle mm -hmm. of the Nagualdenaga. I would sell it on altitude. Four thousand feet, baby. Who else does that? You know, that's a short story, <laughs> right? Like it's short. The thing with Walls with uh, footnotes also works. I always find it does. Oh yeah, because the general <laughs> consumer in the restaurant is really into David Foster Wallace. Only about thirty one. <laughs> anyway, my parting shot as simple as it is in. Um, for the two of you I haven't met personally, I work for an upscale grocery store. I love telling people that with a massive wine department. And I've been lucky enough to know um, the three Michiganders for a long time because I used to be on premise. But um, I'm Madeline, it's good to meet you. And I honestly um, just make the best damn wine you can and get it in our hands. I mean, that's the other thing too, is making it, you know, I have to taste something to get excited about it and tell our wine team about it. You know, uh, I think making it an admission to get it in the hands of uh, key uh, sommeliers or buyers um, is not a small thing, you know, uh, and especially up and coming ones too, because it just shortens the, it shortens the distance between point A and point B. Anyway, thank you for listening to my comments. I was just lurking in the background, Amanda. Well, thank you for lurking. <laughs> thank you. It's an honor. I'm glad you came on. I hope you enjoyed it. Oh, I didn't want to miss it. Are you kidding? This is great. It's a great subject. Thank you for putting it together. I'm sorry. And it's okay. I don't have the wine in front of me because I know I'll, I'll taste something sooner or later. You will when you come up. Oh, we're going to hook you in on one of these too. So don't worry yeah. about that. Cool. <laughs> you and Doug Frost. You and Doug yeah. Frost will be in the net. So Maynard and Doug know each other well also. Oh, excellent. And Doug and I have uh, very different ways of looking at things in a positive way. So this will be a good thing. Yeah. Because in my subconscious, there's only one person and that's the consumer. And in Doug's subconscious, there's yeah. like four people. So it's <laughs> right. <laughs> on, a, on, a, on a slow day, yes. <laughs> yes right. He's smart. He's smarter than I am. That's okay. Well, young, young staff members are also in my subconscious. Yeah. Right. Thank you, everybody, so much. I can't tell you. This was really fun. Thank we, you. We, you know, we're young and we don't have a giant studio, but we think that the content of the conversation is worthy and we're working really hard to wave the flag for all the regions that, you know, Bravo. aren't Budweiser. We're going to keep building it, too. Work in progress.
Thank you for coming. Nina, Sarah, Quail. Thank you, Quail. <laughs> Freckles. Freckles. Thank Freckles. you, Freckles. Freckles. You will be remembered always. Yes. That's Thank all. you. Thank you for having us. I can Thanks. peace out. I appreciate your time in setting the lines. Yep. Bye, Sarah. Bye, Bye. Nina. Bye. Thank you. That was super fun. Yeah. I don't know how to add anything.